Lamb of God, and how each one of us are like sheep that need to be led. In my uh, last church in Waterloo, one of, we had a commissioned lay pastor on staff for a while, and he was a UNI professor that retired. And when he retired, he decided he wanted to become a sheep farmer. That's not how Scott's retirement is going to look. <laughs> Good Lord. Anyway, he, John would uh, have the lambs, and oh my gosh, they were cute and sweet. But God did not bless lambs with the greatest intelligence. And the only way you could get those dumb things to do anything was to either get a dog out there to chase them around, or you'd get a big crooked staff and you whack them, chase them back into the direction they needed to go. And I think that's why we are described as the sheep. Because we aren't the sharpest things that God always wants, but God always seems a way to whack us back into responsibility. And this story that I'm about to read to you from the beginning part of Numbers, and or excuse me, later in Numbers chapter 21, verses 4 through 9, was a moment in which God just wanted to give a good whack to those Israelites who were just being rude and not particularly bright in that moment. Listen once again for God's word. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient along the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous snakes, serpents among the people. And they bit the people so that the many Israelites died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make the poisonous serpents and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it on a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, those snake sounds just give you the willies. They're vile creatures. And they're frightening. And there are moments in each one of our lives where we can be frightened to our core. And yet there in our deepest fears, you provide the means of escape. And we pray that in all things we will turn to you and you will set us free. We ask for your continued care through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Complaints, complaints, complaints. That's all God heard day in, day out. You don't want to be God. It's kind of a pain. Listening to, can you imagine listening to every human being, knowing every human being, the number of hairs on their head, and every complaint they make every single day of the week? Who'd want to be God? And then here are the Israelites. I mean, I can't, I, you cannot blame God for getting upset once in a while. Because here the Israelites are, wandering through the wilderness. God has already given them this wonderful blessing of being taken out of Egypt. They're free, no longer under bondage to slavery by the hand of Pharaoh. And yet, day in, day out, complain, complain, complain. The water's bitter. So the Lord teaches Moses how to sweeten it. Then they complain. There's a lack of food. So God said, all you have to do is ask. And manna comes down out of the skies. Well, I'm thirsty. We just gave you enough. It's never good enough. So Moses goes out and God shows Moses where to whack the rock with the stick and water flows freely, but that's not good enough. We're sick of manna. We want meat. So God provides wind to go up and all of the quail come flying in and they, are, and they have more than enough food to eat. Sick, sick, sick. That's all these people are with their complaining. Finally, after 40 years of this complaining, they could have made it in a day and a half if they hadn't have been complaining so much. They finally get to the promised land. And God is fed up when they start complaining about the fact that they're five feet from the promised land and they don't want to go in because they're scared of the Canaanites. 
If God could bring this whole horde through the wilderness, overcoming the Egyptians, and yet they still couldn't trust, no wonder God got a little angry. So God does something that just seems a little rude and inappropriate. He throws down this whole horde of snakes. Well, that got their attention. It's horrible, those snakes. And I wondered for a long time why God would do that. And first, especially when it said some of them died. But remember, at the end of it, it said everybody who looks up. Now I wonder if even the eyes of the dead are looking, if they, if they tilt their heads up, if they live. Just like Jesus, who is able, when we look up to that cross, we live, not just now, but even in our death, we find resurrection. I struggle with why God would use a symbol that, he, that Pharaoh had on the hat of his own head that had a serpent on it. Why G God would use that same symbol in the wilderness. Except that Pharaoh used that symbol and it didn't set anyone free. God uses it on a stick and everybody lives, is healed. God's more powerful than Pharaoh. New life is brought up. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on snakes because, frankly, I'll get in trouble with Jill because she is scared to death of those things. That's why I played the uh, snake sounds. I was looking at her while I was reading going, gee, I hope she gets the willies. <laughs> but in the Christian church, it isn't a snake that goes up on that staff. It's a cross. And on that cross, we look up and we have life. Now what Pam read so well from John 3, 14 and 15 and onward is truly remarkable. It blends together why this story is important for a Christian. Just as Moses lifted up the, sna the snake in the wilderness, so too the Son of Humanity must be lifted up and therefore receive eternal life. And then we know the next one. But it go, all goes together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall not perish, but have life eternal. And verse 17 is the important one. We all know 16 because of the guy with the afro holding up the sign at a football game. But it's 17 that's most important. For God came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might have life through him. God didn't condemn. Even when God was so angry, he threw snakes in front of everybody. It was just to get our attention when God had tried everything else. And when we complain and we carry on, sometimes bad things happen to us simply because God's got to get our attention. We're so busy complaining, we're looking everywhere else. We're looking for things to complain about. I'm not going to tell you how I drive. I'm looking for a bumper to ride. I'm looking for somebody to holler at. I'm confessing now. But I need to stop and look up. Not so long that I hit the guy in front of me, but long enough to realize that what's truly important, what is God calling us to do? And who do we need to fear? Fear defines what controls us. I have a a silly fear of needles, and especially my blood being drawn. I even talk about it, and my skin gets clammy. I used to pass out just from having my blood drawn. I go into the doctor's office, and they say, oh, Scott's here. We pulled out the bed for you. You just lay down, and we'll do it that way. Farther, not as far to drop. I think it was in fourth grade that I passed out for the first time, and ever since then, it's just a reflex. Can't control it. Finally, after years of having my blood drawn, a few different surgeries and other things, I've gotten to the point that I won't pass out from that. But don't go to the blood bank, because if I even see the blood going up, I get queasy. This is a minister who goes to the hospitals every week, and I'm going, gee, I'm praying for you. I hope everything's okay. <laughs> Scott in an ICU is really an act of faith. <laughs> and you know what I'm talking about because just about everybody has their thing that is beyond their control. 
The minute you talk about it, it gets you all upset and your stomach queasy. And you can't control it. For Jill, that's snakes. Snakes are evil critters. She's from Pennsylvania in the mountain lower north, uh, south central Pennsylvania, right in the Appalachian Mountains. And there are mountain snakes everywhere. You've got copperheads. One day we were out and there was one going through the yard. And the neighbor gone out with a shovel. I was going the other way. He's going right to the problem. Chops the head right off the snake. That snake continued to curl up and strike without a head for another five minutes because that's what snakes do. They are evil, evil critters. There's a reason. <laughs> There's a new reason why God mentions them the way God does in the Bible. <clears throat> and yet, as I go back and wonder why Moses, God told Moses to put that up there, is because that's what people seem to fear most. 36% of American people are scared to death of snakes and call it their number one fear. Now that's fine, but I kind of go, I don't know. If our number one instinct is survival, then I would think death would be our greatest fear. And I think that's what God understood. That's why I think the cross is so important. It symbolizes death. I don't know why we wear the cross around our necks and it makes us feel all groovy and good to see the cross because it's a symbol of the most vile, violent death imaginable. It was painful. It was meant to be slow. To have somebody hang there for the longest period of, the of time. The only, you know, we always guffaw when we hear about the, the soldier walking up and hitting Jesus' knees and breaking his legs while he's hanging on the cross. He was being wonderful and caring because it would allow Jesus to die faster. The reason that the spear went through his side wasn't to make the agony worse. It was to kill him faster. People could hang on that cross sometimes for three and four and five days. It was a blessing that they let Jesus die in a short amount of time. So we hang that around our necks sometimes. But I think the reason that it's acceptable and why I've had crosses that I wear is to remind us that even the most frightening thing, death, is something that God can overcome. Nothing that I fear is beyond God's control. No sin that I commit is greater or more powerful than God's ability to forgive. And nothing that happens to me in this world can keep me from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, including death. That symbol. That's why Protestants do not have Jesus on that cross in a crucifix. Because we believe for us that Jesus is no longer on that cross. Jesus is bound in heaven. Jesus is in our midst. Jesus is no longer suffering. That cross is empty. And that cross is empty to remind us that the crosses we bear, we will not have, bear, we will not bear them forever. One day we will have the ability to be lifted from our cross for all eternity. And that's why as sad as death might be, it is a moment to rejoice. The worst, most painful funerals I've done are for children who never had the opportunity to have, to have a life here on earth. But even that's a celebration. They never had to go through the pain. They never had to go through the suffering, the injustice, and the difficulties of this world. Even that we can celebrate because they've walked into God's heavenly kingdom without having to endure the punishment of this world. God has blessed and blessed each one of us. Now Lucy was baptized today and she's been given a lot of blessings because Chase and especially Aaron are wonderful parents. No. <laughs> I've known Chase a long time which means I get to dig him a little bit more. And Lucy is so blessed because she is one of that very few that have the opportunity 
to have so many blessings in this world. She was born into a country that has freedom and opportunity and parents who love her a lot. And when you narrow down the percentages, that's a small percentage. With that comes the responsibility of making something of herself. But she, most of all, is blessed because she has a mother and father who are going to raise her in the faith so that she knows who she is and whose she is. She will know that in her difficult moments of life that she can look up and see that cross. She knows that in the moments where it is difficult, and I promise you, she will have those moments because we all do. She can look up and see the promise of life eternal. And there's no greater gift than we can give our children than to have that promise fulfilled. That's why we ask parents their question. It isn't just to show off that they know the answer. It isn't so that we can laud them and show how faithful they are. It's to remind them of the responsibility they have to take this child and to impart upon that child the most important thing in this world, her faith. And how fortunate she is, and she doesn't even know it at six weeks old what Chase and Aaron have given her. The foundation that comes with knowing God. I've said this before and I'll say it again. I've been with a lot of people when they've passed from this world. And over and over again, I see the people that fight and frail and carry on the most are those who don't know where they're going and know God only as a stranger. But over and over again, I see those people of faith who are able to let go and to fall into the arms of a loving God because they've known God all their lives. Doesn't mean they don't doubt. It doesn't mean they don't struggle. But at the end of the day, they've known God, known that empty cross, have looked up on so many occasions and been freed from that bondage by that deep and abiding faith. And it is our responsibility, whether we have children or we adopt them as a part of a church family, to make sure that every single one of them knows where to look in the difficult moments and who to invite into the joyous one. We don't need to fear snakes or blood being drawn. We still may struggle with it. But ultimately, it doesn't matter it simply matters that God loves us, that God cares for us, that the distorted thinking is gone and the truth and the reality of God's presence is secure. I ask each and every one of you on this day to renew your faith. Take some moment in this day and just stop long enough to look up for just a moment and to thank God that someone Maybe it was your mom or your dad or a friend, another relative, introduced you to God's church. Think about who they were and the, the time they took. And then say a private thank you to God, a prayer of thanksgiving, because they have given you the greatest gift of all, eternal life. The gift of having God in your midst through the good times, and even more importantly, in the most difficult times. And then thank God for the people that have God placed in front of you along the way. God promised in baptism that God would care for you, whether you're six weeks or 60 or 103. And God has already laid a wonderful foundation for Lucy loving parents, grandparents, and family. And God has laid out wonderful people in your life and will continue to do so. Just look up, stop the complaining, and rejoice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.